Hello everybody and welcome to my Age of Wonders 4 Beginner's Guide. In this video I'm going to take you through everything that you need to know to get settled into the world of Age of Wonders, which can feel a little overwhelming at first. Lots of decisions, lots of customization. Hopefully by the end of this video you'll have a good feel for the game and you'll be ready to hit the ground running. If you like this kind of content, please consider subscribing. We've picked up loads of new subscribers lately, it's awesome to see. And without any further ado, let's jump straight in. And of course, there'll be time cards below if you'd like to skip between sections or repeat something you might have missed. The first decision you'll need to make is choosing a realm. I'm not gonna cover this in much detail here because for the most part, it won't impact specifically the kind of things that I'm looking to share with you in this video. The only thing that I will note is just to take care when you're selecting a realm, if you choose a default one, of these modifiers, the different conditions that are at play. It might be a map type that you don't particularly like. Of course, if you choose to create your own realm, then the possibilities are endless. Once you've selected your realm, you then need to choose a faction, what race of people you want to play. The default ones are perfectly good, so if mucking around with the detail isn't quite your thing, you are absolutely welcome to choose one of these. They're designed very well, and if you hover over them, again, you'll get a feel for what they have. But you might not understand much of that yet. If you choose to create your own faction, however, there are a couple of things that I'd like to point out. Your physical form won't impact you in the game, so you can choose any one of these races, it's totally fine. The important thing to note though, and this is the caveat, is that you'll need to change their body trait and their mind trait. And if you click this little refresh or change button, you'll see all of the options on the right hand side of your screen. I'm not going to go into the meta on what's good or what's not here, but if in doubt, I'd encourage you to pick something that's always good universally applied, something like hearty, where you'll have an extra 10 hit points, for example, or perhaps strong, which increases the physical damage of your people. Again, there'll be design decisions that you'll be playing out here, synergies that will be obvious once you've played for a while, but for now, that's all I'm going to say about race and body traits. Then we move on to culture, and I want to bring your attention to some specific symbols these guys right here. There are six different ones, each a different colour, and each representing what's called an affinity. These affinities will be important as we move through, and they'll affect the kind of research and spells that you can get. However, don't worry if it's overwhelming at this point, because thankfully Age of Wonders is quite forgiving. Even if I were to choose, say, the industrious one here, this affinity will give me extra structures with production income. If I were to choose feudal, I'll be better off at food. So there are definitely some things that will stick with you. However, we'll be able to unlock more of these affinities later and use them in game with things like Tome of Magic. For now, I'm going to choose the feudal affinity or perhaps the barbarian affinity, which brings a little bit of chaos, the militarist affinity, if you will, into the realm. Up in the top left, after I selected barbarian, you'll notice I now have one chaos affinity and one nature affinity. These different affinities will help me in different ways, and here they are again. I now get to select two society traits to add to my people. There are lots of very powerful ones here, but again, in this beginner's guide, I'll stay clear of the meta where I can. What I'd like to highlight is, let's use ancient wise ones as an example, when a tome is unlocked, a new set of research, a random skill from that tome costs 60% less science or knowledge. That's pretty powerful. But either way, as you move through and select different things to build your race, your story, and also your yields, pay attention to the affinity that you're picking up as well, because you'll be able to stack extra points. So for example, if I wanted to be highly militarist and also prolific swarmers, better at founding cities. That would add an additional two chaos affinity, and I'm now at three in total. The last affinity decision here at the start are those tomes of magic that I was talking about earlier. There are five tiers available, and you'll have to research at least about two in each tier before you move up to the next level. You'll notice that they lean into different things and different themes. The tome of enchantment, for example, improves unit enchantment, and specialises in physical damage. Go figure. You'll also notice that there are five, sometimes six, perhaps as low as three, unlocks here. These are spells, and you can think of these if you've played a game like Civilization VI, for example, as your research. 
These are your unlocks. And they vary wildly, by the way, from unlocking new types of unit that you can either summon with magic or train in your cities, through to buffs for cities themselves that you can cast, enchantments for different units or weapon types, and of course, all of the rest. And as I move through, you'll see lots of interesting things, summoning abilities, and you'll also notice it adds additional points to your affinity totals. So if I wanted to spice things up a little bit here, maybe add a little bit of magic into my realm, I might want to move here to the mystic tomes, where I can add astral affinity. I might choose, in this case, the tome of evocation, which will give me all sorts of wonderful things, including new unit unlocks. So I'll select that, and that has added up the top left here again, two astral affinities to my total. The final decision to make is your ruler's origin. And thankfully here, everybody, there's only two things to choose from. You can choose to be a champion where you'll earn more gold, have more stability, your units will get more experience, and you'll be good at relating to the free cities, the neutral cities. Alternatively, you could be a wizard king where you'll get extra mana income, a yield used to purchase spells or units potentially. You'll also be better at casting spells, able to cast them faster with casting points. And you'll have a special over-channel ability. Here again, don't fret too much. However, if you plan on playing a magic-y game, you might want to be a wizard king. If not, perhaps a champion. Now that we have an understanding of affinities and the way that we set up our race, the last thing to do is customize them. Now, th this is a wonderful character customizer, by the way. Look at this. Tiny arms, huge legs. Tiny legs, huge arms. It goes on and on. But there are a couple of things that I want to highlight here because they will affect your game. And really, there's only one key thing, and that is this drop down right here. Easy to miss if you're scrolling through looking at all the options. This will select the default weapon that you'd like your leader, your hero to have. Here I would generally recommend, of course, if you want to be magic, you might want to choose a staff or perhaps a one-handed orb. Alternatively, of course, choose the great axe if you want to go out swinging. And again, to reiterate, the rest of these changes like arm length, leg length, or color don't impact the actual gameplay or playability. It's purely for your design and fun and building a story around it. Now let's talk the start of the game. This is what a beginning of Age of Wonders will look like. Let me give you a brief introduction and beginner's guide into how we'll start to establish an empire and explore the world. You'll likely begin with an army and a scout. Your scout should of course be sent to explore, and take note that the world comes with roads already pre-built onto these tiles. Sticking to the roads will allow you to travel faster, so generally that's the best idea. What are we scouting for? Well, we're scouting for goodies. We're scouting for tiles that might have special improvements on them. Potentially even an entrance into the underground, which you can view at any time in the top right by switching between world map layers. Of course, at the moment, there's not a lot to see down there because we haven't been there yet. But that's the basics of your scout unit, which you can ultimately put on auto explore if you wish. You'll also start with an army and the army will be led by your hero, the person that you've just created. They're a strong unit and when they perish, you can bring them back. The rest of your units, of course, are just standard units. Some of them support, some of them melee. But either way, you'll want to get out and explore the world, because there's plenty to do. You'll notice little goodie caches like this one here, when you can walk over them with a unit and pick up yields for your city. And of course, there'll be enemies to fight as well. NPC armies, and crucially, the players that you're fighting against. At any time, by clicking the button in the top left, you can view your arcane research. This is where our tomes of magic come in, those things we were talking about earlier in the video when we were setting up our faction. Here, we get to choose from one of three options, or shuffle them for a small cost, mana, one of our resources up the top. You might want to select something that you can use straight away, like a unit or an extra enchantment, but regardless of what you select, you'll be able to revisit it at any time by clicking the button in the top left, and you can also view all of the rest of the tomes, so you can get a really good and in-depth feel for the different levels and different unlocks that are available regardless of whether you have that tome available to you right now or not. 
Age of Wonders 4 has a really brilliant 4X system for building an empire and building cities. The way it works in a nutshell is you'll walk around with your hero unit and you'll be able to build outposts so long as they're not directly adjacent to an existing city. Those outposts can then be upgraded into beautiful cities. Uh, let's have a look at my throne city here though as an example. Every time it gains a new population, as shown here over on the left hand side, it's of course a function of how much food you're getting per turn as to how quickly it will increase, you'll be able to expand to an additional adjacent territory. There are a few different improvements on offer. The basic ones are things like farms to give you extra food, or foresters for example to give you a mixture of food and production. Mines can also be built to get gold, and there are magical tile improvements too for resources such as mana or knowledge, your research. When you're building, you might want to pay close attention to the tiles themselves. For example, here a mine is extra good because we'll get an extra 10 gold thanks to this, the gold vein. However, something to note is that you'll get the extra 10 gold regardless of whether you build the mine, or in this case because it's flat land, a farm. So you can still get the bonus 10 regardless of whether you build a mine or not. The reason why I bring this up is because certain improvements, like the farm for example, let me build one here, are required to boost buildings. And this is the other element of empire building. Of course, we can build buildings inside of our cities. And you'll notice that a couple of mine here are already boosted. If I hover over it and look down the bottom of the tooltip, you can see it's been boosted because I've built one farm. That's the boost for the workshop, and it allows me to not only build it quicker, but also cheaper costing me less gold than an equivalent building like the shrine, and taking fewer turns to build. You can hover over anything to see what you need to do to boost it, and I generally recommend that you do that. At the start of the game, it's probably going to look like a few farms, a few quarries, and a few foresters, but as you move through, the requirements might change. Also take note that depending on your race and your affinity, you'll also have unlocked a unique building. This is one of the ways that our early decisions continue to impact us throughout the game. In this case, I've got the battle ritual site. However, as we move through and unlock more research, again on the research tree with the tomes here, we'll be able to get access to different buildings and new buildings, regardless of what we picked at the start. As you explore the world of Age of Wonders 4, you will of course run into combat. Let's do a little simulation right here against this spider-led army that's oh, carefully hiding some books underneath them there. I think there's a bit of knowledge on offer. You have two choices for combat. You can select auto combat and it will be automatically resolved, or you can select manual combat, which will throw you into the fight and let you control your units manually. Go figure. The auto combat in this game is very good, it works very well, and generally speaking, if you have greater combat strength than them, in this case I do, thanks to my superior number of units and also likely superior strength, at least for Goblin Gobbler over here, auto combat will be fine. And wham, bam, thank you ma'am, their units have perished, some of mine have taken some damage, so I might need to bring my army back within my borders so that they can heal passively per turn, but overall it was a successful fight. And we've collected some rewards as well, which you can see down the bottom of the screen. I'd also like to take a brief interlude here to quickly look at settings, because you might notice that my game looks perhaps slightly different to yours. Generally, most of these changes are under the interface tab. You can of course change the ratio of the interface, uh, but more importantly down the bottom here. If you like a hex grid on, so you can see the tiles more clearly, here's your option. You can also turn city labels on and off, province labels on and off, and choose whether borders are very prominent or not prominent at all in the world. Ultimately it's up to you how you want to set this up, but these are my preferred settings. As you explore the world in an attempt to build an empire, you'll come across lots of different things. But the one that I'd like to highlight as an example is this Contender's Ruin here. You can see it's an ancient wonder, these locations around the map that are filled with armies. If you can explore them and defeat them though, you'll reap their rewards. In this case, I'll get a cash reward and a mystery bonus item. And I will have freed up this territory to be able to be annexed by a city. And you'll notice that these territories that have these special features on them give extra special yield. In this case, I'd get an extra 20 knowledge per turn. 
Speaking of yield, we've talked a lot about different ones. I'd like to introduce them quickly by clicking into our city here, Mountwood. You get a really good overview for what your city is producing, so you can identify any weak spots. Food, as we mentioned, is used to grow new population. The more food you have, the faster you'll grow. Next to it is production. This is how quickly you build your buildings. Very important. But as far as growth and expanding an empire goes, remember that food will be key. The last one on the left here is draft. And this is kind of like production, but for building units. Because as you'll notice on the city screen here, I can build a structure and also train units at the same time in Age of Wonders. If at any point I have too much gold, I could also look to hurry the production of a building. And honestly, at the start of the game, if you have a bit of extra cash floating around, it could be a good idea to get something like the storehouse, which provides you with an extra 10 food online extra quick, speeding up your rate of growth and speeding up how quickly you can hoover up the tiles around your city. And hopefully you can snowball it from there. The other four yields on offer are our currencies that we spend to unlock things. Gold is for units and city structures, you can see that here, but the rest of them are a little more nuanced. Mana, which we talked about before, and we can see our total mana, much like our total gold up the top here, is used for casting spells. More on that in a second. Knowledge is our science or research. And then there's Imperium, this last little interesting resource. There aren't many structures that can provide Imperium. You'll notice all of these basic ones at the start don't, with the exception of upgrades and future to the town hall, and then some specific buildings later on. Imperium is very important. It's the currency that you will use to found cities. You can see up the top here that the cost of founding a new city for me is 200 Imperium. You'll also use it for empire development and negotiation. The one that I'm going to focus on in this video will be empire development. Our affinities come together here at the development tree, this beautiful looking structure that is comprised of the six different arms, plus a bottom arm here, which is sort of general. All of your affinities added together equal this total here. Now, remember, we can check our affinities at any time up in the top right, and we can add to them at this point by picking up extra tomes of magic, choosing to research something different. What I'd like to highlight though is that, of course, here we're spending that special currency, Imperium. One of the main ways to spend it, of course, outside of developing your own cities. And there's loads of powerful abilities here, so I'd really encourage you not to sleep on this tree. Uh, things, for example, even quite early on, like Astral Inspiration, whenever a new research skill is researched, the cost of another random skill is reduced by a quarter. That's powerful and it will be powerful throughout the entire game. If we move down to the nature tree, early on you can see, if I click this and upgrade, I'll get my farms an additional plus five food. The general structure of the tree is that the long side, or what I should say, the full side, uh, generally unlocks that will carry through the entire game. They have a lasting and ongoing effect. On the smaller, thinner side of the tree, where there's only perhaps two or three things, it tends to be more one-off abilities. Instantly gain allegiance with city-states, for example. Or perhaps down here, instantly gain knowledge for each province. One time, potentially very strong abilities. And of course, they're on all sides. Under the more militaristic chaos side, I can summon an army in my throne city. Powerful abilities not to be slept on. The other thing I'd like to highlight here, and I'd like to use a specific example of this one, expanded governance, is that some of these things can be done over and over, repeatedly, and expanded governance is one of those. It increases your city cap by one, and then the next time you want to do it, as you can see, it'll cost a lot more, this time 500 Imperium, but I'll be able to increase my city cap again. A quick note on city cap, you can view it up in the top left, and unlike some other strategy games, I'd really encourage you to not go over it because it will make a huge cut, particularly on your knowledge. And you don't want to fall behind on science because if you fall behind on your knowledge and science, your units will be worse and you'll probably fall behind in the game. If there aren't any good empire development options available to you, you can also use Excess Imperium for this neat little thing, attract population to your city faster. Of course, every time we attract a new population, we get to annex a new territory. I've already got one of my farms, maybe I want to build a forester this time, get me a little bit of food and industry, 
And remember, like we talked about earlier, start to unlock extra boosts. Now my battle burial site, for example, a unique structure to me, is much cheaper. So I might queue that one up next. As you explore the map, you'll begin to meet other players or factions, and this is where diplomacy and the AI come in. Uh, for starters, let's take a look at city-states. These are non-aligned, single-state cities. They cannot make extra ones, they cannot win the game, but they play a pretty important role. When you first meet them, you'll be able to give them what's called a Whispering Stone, and you can unlock more of these through Empire Development that we talked about earlier. When you give them a stone, you'll start to work your way through different pacts, starting with something simple perhaps like cooperation, and moving up to a flourishing vassalage where they'll share a lot of their yield with you, about half of what they make and more. You can again here use Imperium, that resource that we use to build cities, to boost your allegiance with them, and hopefully outpace the allegiance of rival empires. First one to vassalize them, ultimately, providing you treat them well enough, will keep that vassalage for the rest of the game, in my experience. Unless, of course, war is declared. So make sure that you're quick, because ultimately you can also incorporate these free cities and take over them completely once they're your vassal. Another powerful way to pick up a city fast in Age of Wonders 4. Most of the things that you meet around the map providing they're not at war with you, won't fight you, including, by the way, NPC armies that have a black banner. However, if you come across one like this, which is called an infestation, they will fight you without any sort of declaration of war or anything like that. So take care as you're moving around the world and keep yourself safe. One way to keep yourself safe and provide extra benefit is through the casting of spells that you unlock, again, through the research tree. Here you can check at any time up the top how much mana you have, the currency that you'll use to cast spells and upkeep magical units, for example, and also your casting points. This is kind of how quickly you'll be able to cast a spell. The more points you have, the fewer turns it'll take. You can open up the spells down the bottom next to your portrait, just to the left of it, where you'll see a list of available spells. And once you've selected them, paid the cost, and waited however many turns worth of casting points you need, you can then use it. Uh, in this case, as a quick example, I've got a spell called Summon Lesser Storm Spirit, and it's ready to go. So I can just click anywhere on the map, let's say next to this army, and summon a unit. Now this is a very basic spell. There are wild units, terraforming spells that can literally change the world underneath you, and race transformation spells that can provide your people with powerful and permanent upgrades to their very DNA. Spells are very strong, and I'd encourage you to keep checking, make sure that you're using lots of spells as you move through. As you meet other AI players, those that you are directly competing against for victory, and we'll talk about victory in a little bit too, you'll start to get a real feel for what they are like, and you can have a look at them by clicking their portrait once you've met them up the top, and get a quick feel for their personality the kind of empires that they like and dislike. And this will help you figure out whether you want to form an alliance with them, or perhaps whether you're just destined to not get along. And like most things in Age of Wonders 4, of course, we have lots of options. We could declare a friendship or a rivalry, push our relationship towards positive or negative. Uh, we can also negotiate, trade resources, or develop pacts, and up here under these pacts is where you'll ultimately be able to forge an alliance if you want to. Building up these pacts will help improve relations. Empire relations might move up and into the positive, meaning you'll be more likely to keep them as a friend, and anything that you do to generate grievances, like settling too close to them, stealing one of their vassals, for example, will make it more likely that they'll declare war on you. You can settle grievances by selling them to an enemy empire, but generally, those are the two things you need to keep in mind when you're negotiating with enemies or potential allies. What's your relationship like? How aligned are your empires? And how have you pissed each other off? What kind of grievances have been made? We're going to move forward a little bit now in the timeline and talk about a few different things. Some things that come up as you move through the game. 
I'd like to direct your attention, ladies and gentlemen and everyone at home, to the top left of your screen. There are a few really handy shortcuts here, like the diplomacy overview, where you can quickly see what your relations are like with another empire, in this case, a bit of a yikes, and also what your diplomatic status is like. In this case, interestingly, we're still allies, whereas these players down here dislike me and we're at war. You can also track active quests, side quests, or your main victory conditions. We'll talk about them in a later section in the video though. Uh, the next one is your hero overview, and this is one that I really want to stress, because unlike the rest of them, say the city overview here, which is a really nice way to visualize your cities, but ultimately not impactful on the game, likewise with the armies, the hero overview is, here you'll be able to select your hero, inspect them, get a good look at what you've got going on, but also upgrade. And there are two different things that you'll upgrade. The first will be their gear, as demonstrated by these circles around the right, 10 of them in total. As you find, develop, or steal, however you want to get new gear, you'll find it available on these different equipment screens. You'll then be able to simply select a spare one or swap out one that you like. So at the moment, Hella Fawny is using an orb. But maybe I've changed my mind and I want her to use a great sword instead. Well, here's how I change that. There's also powerful abilities available, like, for example, this spider leg that'll let her summon an extra unit, a spider, in battle. A great way for me to get above the traditional 18 versus 18 cap on units in normal units in Age of Wonders 4. The other thing to note here is the upgrades. These are achieved as your hero, like any other unit, gains experience by fighting, perhaps or in some cases by simply walking around the world, depending on your upgrades. Click this little button and you'll see a whole load of skills. You could feel slightly overwhelmed looking at this and you'd be fair for doing so. Again, I'd encourage you to stick to the basics. If you're not sure what to do, choose something that is always useful. Extra defense, perhaps. If I'm a melee fighter, fighting. Or, and this is a little bit of an extra for experts, I'd encourage you to explore right down the bottom to some of these support traits. Some of these are very strong and they impact an entire army, not just the leader themselves. Uh, the final category, the one that's in the middle, is based around battle magic. It's kind of self-explanatory. You may also unlock specific ones to do with your affinities or race, and you'll see those pop up from time to time. Now the end game. Let's put it all together and talk victory conditions in Age of Wonders 4. There are four of them. You can toggle them on and off in the game settings at the start. Let's start with a magic victory. To achieve that, you'll need to research a tier 5 tome, like Tome of the Chaos Lord here. To do that, you'll need to make sure that you've researched the appropriate tier 3 and 4 tomes before it. Remember, you can check in your library to see how your progress is going. Once you have a tier 5 tome researched, it's then up to you to build three monuments. A seed, a heart, and a root of the appropriate tome. In this case, I'm building the Heart of Chaos. You can build one monument per city, so it's a good idea to keep some cities close together so that you can defend the monuments as they are placed generally on city borders. Once you have your three monuments down, your heart, seed, and root of whatever tome you've researched, it's now time to defend them and to cast the spell. In this case, I'm launching the Age of Chaos spell because I researched through the Chaos tomes. Once the spell has been cast, a dark shadow, or a red shadow in this case, falls over the world. And then I have 15 turns to defend these beacons, these monuments, and if I do... I win the game. Uh, similarly is the expansion victory. Here, however, of course, we're not required to research a tier 5 tome. That's about knowledge. In this case, we're required to control a majority of the map, either in our own borders or through our allied, vassalized city-states. Once we have majority, we build three beacons of unity and then light the beacons, causing players around us likely to declare war on us, and just like with the magic victory condition. We also face AI opponents that will spawn around our seeds, hearts, or in this case, beacons of unity because this is the expansion victory. Again, I'd like to reiterate, it's a good idea to keep your cities close together. You can only build one of these monuments per city, so keep them nice and clustered, and that way you'll be able to do what I'm doing here and bring your armies in quickly and defeat the NPCs that have spawned on top of the beacons. 
Lastly, we have domination victory, where you simply need to take down all of the enemy cities, throne cities, their capital cities only, and ensure that the enemy's leader hero has passed away. If they've been taken out and their throne city is being held by not them, so anyone else, then they're gone for good. All you need to do is make sure that you take everyone out or ally with them. You don't actually have to destroy everybody. If you've managed to ally up with an opponent, then you don't need to take them down. Simply destroy the remaining throne cities and ensure that the leaders have perished. Uh, finally, there is a score victory. Uh, by default, the player who's achieved the most throughout the game at the end turn, by default 150, will be crowned victorious. Uh, regardless of how you get there at the end of a run, whether you've been defeated or hopefully emerged with victory, you'll be able to ascend to the Pantheon, which you should accept. You'll see your ruler again in future games, maybe as an ally, maybe as a foe, and you'll also get to unlock interesting abilities like progression, uh, cosmetic items, but also some powerful perks for your races in future. Thank you so much for joining me today for this extensive beginner's guide in Age of Wonders 4. I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. These kinds of videos take a lot to put together, so if you wouldn't mind leaving a like, maybe joining us with a subscribe, that would be grand. And I'll see you very soon for more Age of Wonders 4, including some specialised and focused tutorials.